So hey everyone, today I'm going to talk about a couple of things that for a very long time I didn't know about CSS. So the kind of weird little tricks and fun facts that took me a very long time to figure out or that just surprised me when I finally did find out about them. So hopefully some of these things are surprising and entertaining to you as well and maybe they'll help you view CSS in a different light because that's kind of what I'm going for here. So first, uh, hi, I'm Matthias. I work for Opera Software in developer relations, and before that, I used to freelance as a web developer. Uh, I like web standards, programming, web security, and working on open source projects. And if you have any questions, just mention me on Twitter, and I'll get back to you. But let's get started. Let's start off with everyone's favorite CSS feature, importance. Hell yeah. So I'm sure you're all familiar with what important does, right? In a situation like this, for example, all the elements with class bar get a green color. But if such an element is within another element with class foo, then it would get a red color, right? So that looks something like this. So whenever there's a conflict between two CSS selectors, then usually the last one in the source code wins. But in this case, the specificity for both selectors is different. And in that case, the one with the higher specificity wins. And that's why the color is red. I'm sure I'm not telling you anything new here. Uh, now, in some situations, you may need to override an earlier rule set, though. So in this case, if you want all elements with class bar to be green, despite of the earlier rule there at the top, then you can use importance to boost that single declaration's precedence. And just to show you that this actually works well, if you add important there, the color is suddenly green. So. This is nothing new, right? But what once surprised me about this is that important has nothing to do with specificity. It's actually a completely different thing. So important boosts a single declaration's precedence without affecting the specificity of the selector or the entire rule set. Now, you may have heard that the use of important is a bad practice, and that's kind of true. But luckily, we can fake it. There is a way to use important without actually using important. Instead of boosting the declaration's precedence, we can increase the selector specificity. All we have to do is just repeat the class name in the last selector a couple of hundred times. <laughs> so every time you repeat that class name in there, you boost that selector's precedence and that specificity. So if you just do this enough times, then eventually that selector is always going to win. So what you're doing here is you're effectively telling the CSS engine to select all elements with class bar that also have class bar, that also have class bar, and so on. But indeed, this actually works. So there you have it, your first new best practice of the day. So another thing I'd like to talk about is CSS comments. As you probably know, this is the only comment syntax that CSS supports. So it starts with a slash followed by an asterisk, and it ends with an asterisk followed by a slash. And anything in between those two things will be part of a comment, and it will effectively be ignored. So even new lines and stuff like that. And that's why this example works the way you would expect it to. The color colon red declaration is ignored. Now, lots of other programming languages have a single line common syntax as well, which starts with two slashes. And anything on the same line after those slashes will be ignored as well. But CSS doesn't have this syntax. It doesn't support single line comments like that. So this is actually invalid CSS. But what surprised me here is that the previous code example would actually still work the way you would expect it to. I mean, the line with color colon red will not have any effect. So what's the deal there? What's going on? Well, property names in CSS are supposed to be valid CSS identifiers, and identifiers cannot contain unescaped slashes. So because we're trying to use slashes here, uh, this one rule fails to parse, and CSS just skips it. Now, if the property name was a valid identifier instead, then the CSS would get parsed just fine. However, there's another rule that says that unknown properties will silently be ignored in CSS. So this gives us another way to fake single line comments in CSS. We can just use British spelling. Or another thing you could do is just make a few typos in the property name. It's kind of crazy, and you should probably never deliberately do this, but it kind of works in the sense that the rule will silently be ignored. So Tab Atkins has an excellent blog post that explains these tricks, and it's a good way to learn a little bit about CSS grammar and how error handling in CSS works. So check it out. Now, there's something else that's related to CSS that I'd like to show you, but before I can do that, we need to talk a little bit about HTML tags. So just to a show of hands, who knows the difference between HTML tags and elements? OK, just to make sure we're all on the same page, uh, tags are the things that you enter in your code editor when you're editing an HTML file. So if you have a paragraph, for example, you may want to open that with a start p tag, and then you can close that with an end p tag. Those are two tags. But as soon as the browser parses and renders that document, 
we no longer think in terms of tags, uh, but instead the browser turns the whole thing into a DOM with elements. And elements is what gets styled using CSS, and elements is what you can interact with uh, in JavaScript. So that's kind of the difference. So here's a simple HTML document. You see those HTML head and body tags? Well, it turns out that their end tags are optional, so you can just omit them. And the result is a compact but valid HTML document that results in exactly the same DOM as the previous document. So different tags, but the exact same number of elements. But it gets even better, because apparently you can also remove the star tags for these elements. And then you end up with this very minimal but valid HTML document that still results in exactly the same DOM. So note that the HTML and the head and the body elements will still be there in the DOM, even though they're not part of the HTML source code. So these elements are kind of implied, and browser automatically create them for you, even if they're missing from the markup. So with that in mind, this is probably the most useless tattoo ever. I mean, if you're going to get an HTML tattoo, at least pick some tags that aren't implied, right? So that minimal HTML document I just showed you got me thinking, how far can we take this? What more can we remove from our HTML source code once we stop caring about what's valid and what's not? And then I came across Martin Cole's experiment called No JavaScript, and he attempted to recreate a game using CSS only. So the goal was to use no JavaScript at all and almost no HTML. In fact, this is the full HTML source code for his project. It's just one line that includes a style sheet onto a page. And you should really check this out for yourself. The URL is right there. But just to give you a quick idea of what it looks like, uh, well, yeah, this is it. So remember, this is all CSS. And I'm not sure if you can see this, but the mouse cursor is actually following that spaceship at the bottom. Um, so that seems like a very easy thing to do if you have access to JavaScript, but in pure CSS, it's not that simple. And the elements that are being styled here are the ones that the browser automatically creates for you, even if they're not part of the source code. So HTML, head, and body. Then there's also that link element that was in the HTML source. You can style that as well. But of course, the link and the head elements are invisible by default. But you can just override that by applying display block to them. And then you can give them a width, give them a height, add a background image, and there you go. So HTML, head, link, and body. That's four elements. And by using the before and the after pseudo elements, that totals up to 12 unique styleable blocks. Just 12 styleable blocks. And that's enough to create this, apparently. It's kind of crazy, right? It still blows my mind. So I made a demo of my own. It's not nearly as impressive as the last one to look at. Uh, in fact, it looks very simple. And if I were to see this on a random website, I would probably think it was just a paragraph element or you know, some basic HTML with some text in it and then some basic CSS to style it. But in fact, if you look at the source code, you'll see that it's completely empty. So what is going on there? Well, this is going on. I'm using the link HTTP header here. And in theory, this header can be used instead of the link element in HTML. Anything you can do using the link element in HTML can also be done using the link HTTP header in browsers that support it. And at the moment, so if you want to try this out, uh, there's only one browser that supports it, and it's Firefox. So if you want to check out this demo, do it in Firefox. Opera used to support this before we switched to Blink, but it's one of those things that we got lost. Um, so anyway, this gives us a completely empty HTML document that still gets a CSS file applied to it. Then the next step is to make that document look like it contains some actual text. So for this, I use the CSS content property. So I select the body element, and then I target its after pseudo element, and then I just give it some content. And that is how this demo, without any HTML source code at all, works. So is this useful? I don't know. Maybe you can use this to prank your colleagues, or if you're really evil, you could use it for an amusing interview question. So you could give your interview candidates a URL that they should open in Firefox. And that URL points to an HTML document that contains inline SVG that displays a circle. That circle's fill attribute is set to red. And that's when you ask the interview candidate why the circle is green instead of red. <laughs> yeah. It would probably take them a very long time to realize that there's a hidden CSS file that magically gets applied to the document. And the styles are not even visible when inspecting the element in DevTools. So yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> Now, if you want to talk about Unicode in CSS, we need to talk about Unicode in HTML, too. 
So the first thing you should know is that the class attribute accepts every possible character. No matter what value you give it, it will always be valid. And it will work in every browser, too. So for example, 404-error is a valid class name, which is probably not very surprising. But you could also use the copyright sign, for example, as a class name for an element containing a legal disclaimer. And what's new in HTML5 is that the same thing now goes for ID attributes. And this is new. So the only exception is that IDs cannot contain spaces, but everything else goes. So you could use the heart symbol as the ID for a paragraph, or you could use curly quotes as a class name for a block quote element. Or, well, you could do all kinds of stuff. You can even use hidden emoji to passive-aggressively tell people they're using a shitty browser. <laughs> and all of this is valid HTML. Now, this also means that we can do stuff like this, where you give an element an ID of hash ID, hmm, or a class of dot class. Or you could even combine the two and then add colon hover braces at the end. <laughs> or you could even use a value that resembles an attribute selector. Uh, so all these classes and IDs already look like a CSS selector, right? So how would you select these elements based on their IDs and classes in CSS? Well, the answer is we need to escape these values first so that they become valid identifiers. There's that word again. So only then can we use them as part of a CSS selector. And here's what that would look like. The hash symbol, for example, has special meaning in CSS, so it cannot be used as it is. It must be escaped as backslash hash first. And the same thing goes for the dot character. That becomes backslash dot. Now, the colon character needs escaping too, and theoretically it can be escaped as backslash colon, but that doesn't work in old Internet Explorer. So a more compatible way to escape it is to use backslash 3a followed by a space, which is kind of weird, right? So as you can see, many characters need escaping. Uh, but take a look at that last example. It's an element with ID 404-error. Because that ID starts with a digit, it needs to be escaped too, because that's not a valid identifier. And I remember that this really surprised me at some point, because I was trying to, trying to style an element like that, and it seemed to be impossible to style using CSS. Um, so it turned out I just had to escape it as backslash 34 space 04-error, which is kind of weird. So if you ever need to style an element whose class or ID starts with a digit, I'm sure you'll think back on this moment. Now, as for the other examples with the non-ASCII Unicode symbols, well, those can just be used as they are without escaping them, uh, because they don't have any special meaning in CSS. Of course, you can still escape them if you wanted to, but it's just not necessary. Because I really wanted to understand all this, I built a tool for this that allows you to enter any ID or class name, even the crazy ones, and then it will tell you how to select that element in CSS or in JavaScript using the selectors API. So if you're using jQuery, for example, and you want to select one of those elements, this tool will tell you how. Nowadays, there's a standardized utility method for this in the form of a JavaScript API called css.escape. So this is part of the CSS object model specification. And at the moment, this is implemented in Firefox. Um, but there's a polyfill too, so you can start using this today if you need it. And the thing is, you probably need this much more often than you would think. Like here, for example. I'm sure many of you have done something like this at some point. I know I have. Um, so you read the hash from the URL, and then you use it to select an element in JavaScript. This is fairly common if you use a depth widget on your page or something like that. So what if that location hash contains a space, for example? Instead of uh, selecting an element based on its ID, then the whole meaning of the selector would change, because it would then become a descendant selector instead, which is not what you anticipated. Now, here's another example. What if some value contains double quotes in this case? It would break out of the attribute selector and it would effectively break the whole selector, resulting in JavaScript errors or worse. So this code is actually broken, but it's not really obvious to see that. So how can we fix this? Well, all you have to do is just wrap the variable parts of the selector in CSS to CSS point escape. And of course, use the polyfill if you want to support all browsers. So now that we're on the subject of breaking things using malformed CSS selectors, let's take a look at how CSS can be used for evil. So first, we need to talk about cross-site scripting, or XSS. Has anyone ever heard of that before? OK, so some people, which is good. But even if you have heard of it, I would recommend checking out Google's cross-site scripting game. It's a really great way to learn how cross-site scripting attacks work and how you can exploit them yourself. And if you give this a try, you'll be surprised how simple this actually is. 
So most websites nowadays display user-supplied content in different contexts within an HTML document. Here, a user color is inserted in the context of a CSS value. The username is inserted in an HTML text content as part of a paragraph element. The user profile URL is injected as a quoted HTML attribute value. The user ID is inserted in a JavaScript context on the right-hand side of a variable declaration. And finally, some server-generated debug information is printed as part of an HTML comment. So all these things are variable content which can be controlled or at least influenced in some way by the user. The website that displays this information needs to make sure that the user input is properly sanitized and escaped before uh, returning it to the user. And that's just a problem that is not as simple as it sounds, because each of these five different contexts requires different forms of escaping. It's really easy to make a mistake there. So usually, web application hackers look for a mistake like this, and that leads to a cross-site scripting vulnerability. And this enables them to basically execute custom JavaScript in the context of the targeted website. So once they've found such a vulnerability, they can do anything they want in JavaScript. Uh, they could add a script that listens for keyboard events and then uh, locks anything that the victim enters back to their own server. So sensitive information could also be read from the DOM, for example, and then leak to the attacker's server. It's very dangerous. But, and that's why attackers usually go for cross-site scripting attacks, because uh, they're really powerful. But this is not a JavaScript conference, it's CSS conf. So let's change the perspective here. As a hacker, what's the worst thing you can do if you have full control over a page's CSS, but nothing else? So what if all these injections are sanitized properly except for the first one? And for the sake of the example, just assume that there is some sort of sanitation going on there that makes it impossible to close the style element. Um, so everything else is allowed. You can inject any CSS you want, but you, there's no way to inject arbitrary HTML. What damage can you do with that? Well, let's see. Um, does anyone remember the CSS Sand Garden? Yeah. Well, if you don't, just Google it, and you'll end up at this website. It's a simple HTML page, really, and it can be styled using CSS. No surprise there. And the thing is, anyone can contribute a CSS file to this website, and it will be applied to the same HTML file. And uh, the idea is that anyone can create a custom design that way. So here's some examples. There's over 200 different designs on that website. Um, and they all look beautiful and completely different. And remember, the only thing that's changing between these designs is the CSS. The HTML remains exactly the same. So it's a very powerful demonstration of what CSS can do, in my opinion. Now look at it from the perspective of an evil hacker, right? Uh, imagine having that kind of power over a website that you're attacking. The obvious thing to do as an evil hacker is, of course, to completely deface the website. So here's the original CSSConf website, for example. But if you had full control over the CSS, you could make it look like this if you wanted. So I'm not sure if anyone would buy tickets on a website like this. Um, but when an attacker is able to control the CSS of your page in such a way, that's probably not what you want. It's not a very good user experience either. Uh, but you could do something else as well, something similar. There's another thing you could do, and that's similar to defacing but much more subtle. Uh, you wouldn't touch the design, but you would just inject some really annoying CSS rules. And there's a project that collects rules like that. It's called evil.css. And it's just a CSS file with a bunch of really annoying, frustrating CSS rules. Um, so here's, again, the original CSSConf website. And here's that same website with evil.css enabled. So there's now extra scroll bars everywhere. The layout is slightly broken. Some of the content is flickering or missing. The text is just slightly blurry. And scrolling feels really slow because they add a bunch of really uh, bad for performance CSS rules. Uh, the first letter in each element is a tiny bit smaller than all the others. It's, oh, it's really frustrating. It's a really bad user experience. Um, so I think we can all agree that both defacing and doing this sort of thing is really annoying for the administrators and the visitors of a website. But it could be much worse, because with cross-site scripting, sensitive information could be stolen. So is such a thing possible using only CSS? Well, well kind of, yeah. Um, Mike's, Mike West already demonstrated this last year at CSSConf, so I'll keep this short. But CSS kind of allows you to leak the value for any attribute in the DOM. Um, some attribute values contain security-sensitive information. Like in this case, if you were an attacker and you wanted to steal this value attribute here, which is supposed to be a secret token, uh, using nothing but CSS injection, how would you go about it? Well, 
one thing you could do is use the CSS attribute starts with selector, and that way it's trivial to figure out the first character of that token just by brute forcing it. You just write a CSS selector for every possible starting character, and as soon as the value matches, then the corresponding background image will be loaded from the attacker server, so that value is effectively exfiltrated to the attacker. The same thing can then be repeated for the next character and the character after that, and so on. So in the worst case scenario, you would have to enumerate all the possible values for the CSRF token. And of course, that's not very efficient or fast, but it does demonstrate that it is possible to exfiltrate sensitive data this way using nothing but CSS. But still, it could be worse, of course. There could be an efficient way to leak data, like we have with cross-site scripting. Uh, it's a good thing we don't have any of that in CSS. Or do we? Well, yeah, we kind of do, it turns out. IE5 introduced this proprietary feature called CSS expressions to make it possible to dynamically calculate the values for CSS properties. And this feature was supported up until IE7. Now, even if you have never seen this before, if you just look at the syntax closely, you'll note that the code wrapped in the expression is actually JavaScript. So yes, yeah, CSS expressions are basically a way to run JavaScript in CSS. It's a great idea. I'm not sure what could possibly go wrong here. <laughs> so because it's all just JavaScript, stuff like this works too. You have full access to the DOM and to all the methods that the browser adds to the page. Uh, so you could show an alert message like this. And that would look something like this. Or you could do something slightly more useful as an attacker. You could open a new window with the URL of our choice using nothing but CSS. And this could be the URL for a malicious website like a phishing site that pretends to be the original website but instead steals your data, for example. OK, so you may be thinking, this sucks. But if it only affects IE7 and older versions, then what's the big deal? No one really supports those anymore, right? Well, Internet Explorer has this thing called browser modes, and the latest three major IE releases each shipped multiple rendering engines that kind of emulated the bugs in old IE versions. And the F12 developer tools allow you to easily switch between them. But it's also possible to trigger a specific rendering mode for your website by using an HTTP header or an HTML meta element. And the meta tag on this page will ensure that your document is rendered using the latest available rendering mode. So in IE11, it would use IE11 rendering mode. In IE10, it would use IE10 mode, and so on. And as a developer, this is usually what you want. However, this is also possible. This meta tag would trigger IE7 mode, even in IE8 or IE9 or IE10 or IE11. And this mode not only emulates the known bugs that IE7 used to have, but it also brings back deprecated and removed features, like CSS expressions. So our initial example that only worked in IE7 and older can now be made to work even in IE8, IE9, and IE10 just by adding a meta tag. It even works in IE11, but it's slightly trickier there. The site needs to be in the trusted zone. But still, it's kind of a problem, right? So this is all pretty cool, but in our attack scenario from before, we could only inject CSS and not arbitrary HTML like the meta tag in the targeted website. So given those limitations, how can we still make use of this trick? Well, the attacker could create a web page of their own and host it on their own server, trigger IE7 compatibility mode, and then embed the targeted website with that CSS payload in an iframe. And in that case, it turns out that the document mode of the parent document is inherited by the targeted website in the iframe, even if normally that website would render using the latest available rendering mode. So it overrides any meta tags that they would have set. So this effectively allows attackers to use CSS expressions in the context of the target website, even in IE10. So to recap, there's two conditions here. If a target website allows you to inject arbitrary CSS, and it also allows framing, then this enables hackers to perform cross-site scripting attacks on your site in Internet Explorer using nothing but CSS, as crazy as that sounds. So as a website administrator, how can we make sure that our sites doesn't, don't fall prey to CSS expression vulnerabilities? Well, of course, all of this can be avoided if you just sanitize all untrusted input before injecting it into your responses. So all you have to do is never make a single mistake, and everything will perfectly be fine. Failing that, um, a safe thing to do is to use the XFrame Options HTTP header to prohibit framing of your web page. And this makes it impossible for an attacker to easily kick your site into i7 compatibility mode and thereby bring back CSS expressions. <laughs> 
And last but not least, um, you should use the so-called HTML5 doc type, you know, the short one, uh, because IE uses that as a heuristic to disable CSS expressions even if your page gets framed and inherits IE7 document mode. And no other doc type has this effect. So this is a very safe thing to do if you're still using another doc type on some pages, just replace it with this shorter version and it will make your page more secure in a way. So this is all kind of crazy to think about, isn't it? You need to add an HTTP header and use a specific doc type in your HTML just to prevent people from running JavaScript in your CSS. Oh, it's kind of crazy, but you know that's old Internet Explorer, I guess. However, it's not just IE. You can kind of execute JavaScript using nothing but CSS in other browsers as well. In Firefox, for example, if you assign a background image to an element and point it to a JavaScript URL, then that script will be executed, but in a sandbox. So you can't actually use this to steal data from the DOM or do anything really useful, but you could still do something like this, where you trigger an infinite loop, and if you then open that page in Firefox, it looks something like this. Yeah, not much is happening there. Um, Firefox is kind of crashing at this point, um, so there's nothing you can do at this point other than force quit it and start over. So again, this is not a good experience for your users, and you don't want this to happen. All right, so that's all I had to show you today, and hopefully you agree that CSS is much more powerful than it seems. Uh, but I think we still have time for a quick CSS quiz, right? Yeah, I think so. So what band is this? Feel free to shout the answer if you think you know. The Blackies, hell yeah. These guys. OK, let's try another one. What band is this? I'm sorry? No. What color is that, F-O-O? -O. Yeah, maybe this one was too simple, but it's simply red. This <laughs> guy. <laughs> OK, let's try another one. What band is this? Any guesses or welcome? Hell yeah, the White Stripes. Nice one. OK, what song is this? Yep, this is the first line of Painted Black by the Rolling Stones. I see a red door, and I want it painted black. And you can do that using CSS blend modes. <laughs> OK, one more. What band is this? Yep, Green Day. <laughs> OK, one last one. What band is this? The Black Eyed Peas, yeah. <laughs> OK, so there they are. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And thanks to all the people whose research and jokes I've stolen in this talk. So thanks. Thank